what about progressing through the different types of training methods out there? So if you've watched any of my videos, um, you may notice the background's a little different. I'm at my house, actually. We had a pretty gnarly ice storm. But anyway, uh, so filming from home, like, who cares? Just get to the point. You got it. So let's talk about progressing through different types of methods that exist in the barbell sport, strength conditioning, uh, weightlifting, um, just general training, whatever it may be. Uh, there, there's uh, questions many times about, well, what's the best way to do things? Um, and I have different ways in which uh, people approach training here on this slide. And I'm going to talk through these different ideas that exist. And you may find that one or more of these uh, fit where you are at as an individual that's training and the type of training that you're doing. I'm not going to advocate um, that any one of these ways is necessarily superior to the others. Um, I'll tell you about what my experiences are with each one of them. And um, while um, I said not one way is superior to the others, I think they're appropriate times to use one method over the other. How's that? So, by the way, if, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my channel. Lots of videos up on in the field of strength conditioning, strength, uh, sports science, nutrition science, exercise science, you name it. Um, like this video and leave a comment below as well. Okay, so let's talk about this slide. Um, number one, percentage-based training. Uh, so that would be, and I would lock this into also rep-based training, um, you know, in a sense, if, if you were saying maybe you're going to go to failure or near failure, um, that goes into that next one, RER, um, or IR, excuse me, uh, repetitions observed, but percentage-based training. So in other words, you might say, and, and I'm mostly talking about compound lifts here. Um, and so you might say, I'm do bench workouts, at, uh, working up to an ascending pyramid, 75, 80, 85, or I'm doing 85, for three across three sets. I'm going to put the load on the bar and try to hit the reps with the percentage of one RM, whatever my one RM is that, um, you know, is effective. Um, I used to move, use this method almost exclusively, uh, to be honest. And, um, I saw firsthand the ups and downs, the pitfalls of this method. Um, basically what you're doing is you're locking in the individual, you're locking yourself into a load. Uh, now, of course, you can adjust it as you go, but the idea is that you work up to this load. And the the downside of doing this type of training is that um, if you can't hit the load for the day, it's very discouraging, and then that can actually ramp up fatigue quite quickly. So uh, you're supposed to be hitting 100, you know, I'm going to use this example, 300 pounds on uh, the squat today for triple, and you can't hardly get one. That's one, discouraging, and two, you have just you you should have been recovering that day, and instead you just smash yourself against the rocks. Conversely, you may feel great and 300 could you, you could have did 80 times, right? Okay, that's exaggeration. You could have did eight times, perhaps. I mean, you're really climbing up the, the in your strength. And so this is a problem as well. Um, the way I worked around this at one point was what I called hyphen sets. And so I gave the rep range on the last set. So I would say work up through your progression. Uh, if it was an ascending pyramid and then do five to seven reps at this load. So kind of gave the individual a bailout at five um, and then they had a higher rep seven if they could do it it's like adjustable progressive resistance exercise nothing fancy but it gave at least a, a margin for the individual to work within um and it, it allowed for down days and allowed for up days it didn't it wasn't as discouraging well, i only got four at the bottom end but you still got that bottom number right so um if they crushed the load i would up their max right and that can be effective uh, but again the problem is is that it this method doesn't do a good job of moving with the individual. And if you know anything about it, it can work a little bit better in controlled environments, like maybe a collegiate setting, perhaps. But even then, I mean, you have ups and downs in the, in the person's and in individual's days, right? They could, you know, had a bad day, didn't sleep, didn't eat right, whatever. They've been sick, so on and so forth. Um, and so um, is percentage-based training garbage? No, it is not. Um, it, I think it's effective in guiding load early on, although it has its limitations as well, especially people are starting out, they're going to gain strength quite quickly. Um, and that's the problem with it, right? The one RM, it, it, that's what I'm getting at through all I'm talking about here is the one RM or whatever RM you're basing on repetition max, it changes from day to day. So you, you know, the day you set your one RM, you were feeling amazing and you, you know, you hit that 400 pound number, but now, you know, today you feel terrible and you're tired and it's late in the cycle of the training and you're just, you know, you're feeling awful and your true max for the day is actually 380. And, you know, any percentage based off of 400 now is more, you know, if you're supposed to be doing 80%, you're doing 90%. And that's why you're getting crushed. Okay. So is percentage garbage? No. Um, I think it can form a really nice stem. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, to a jumping off point, um, I do think it provides some guidance for those that, um, you know, are maybe past that initial stage or just flat out have a hard time picking loads. Um, you can, you know, you can say, Hey, give them those hyphen set ranges and saying, okay, 
uh, if you're a trainer or yourself and say, oh, if I hit the top end of this rep range and obviously I need to go up and wait next time, that can be an effective way to do things. The old NSCA two, you know, the two for two rule, right? Two reps at for two weeks in a row. If you hit those extra two reps, you should go up in your max and so on. But um, again, for somebody just starting out though, they're going to make pretty drastic gains in strength, significant gains in strength early on. And so sticking too close to a one RM percentage can slow somebody down in that case. And again, at the high end, it could really hurt somebody because they just keep smashing against the rock. So um, I kind of have a mix in training. There's some days I go off a percentage um, and then other days that I don't. And I've over the years, I've gone to more of an auto-regulated type of approach as long as the individual is motivated, understands it. And that's the other where, part where percentages may be helpful. Let's say you're coaching a bunch of athletes. You're going to have the motivated and you're going to have the lazy. Uh, and it'll at least keep the lazy honest. It's just, you're going to punish then some of the, the motivated because they're going to be putting loads on the bars that, you know, is going to punish them when they should be maybe pulling back a little bit. Okay. So I think percentage based training is, is a tool. I don't think it's something that has to be thrown away. I don't think it's something that, um, should be rigidly followed. And I used to be a big percentage based person. Um, and again, I still use it. Um, but I use it with combination. All right. The next one reps in reserve. Um, so this is like two to fail. Um, I think Helms is, is probably the lead one I, from what I've seen, um, that's pushed this and, um, it, it's, I use this in remote coaching. Um, and it's, it's, it's got a downside of it takes a little bit to get used to. Uh, you know, it's hard to understand like two, two to fail. Like, well, what is that? Most people are, uh, you know, used to going to failure. Um, but really, especially the compound lifts can be very, helpful uh you know like in the bench press like don't you know we know the compound lifts you can ramp up fatigue quite quickly as compared to a, like a biceps curl an isolation type exercise so um, reps and reserve i think is an effective method once you kind of get the idea it may be helpful early on uh to get a little bit closer to failure not to failure again and we have to be very careful here if somebody's just starting out and you're like okay i'm gonna get you closer to failure in a back squat well they, they hardly can even back squat right um, you know, an athlete that is super strong, getting close to failure could be dangerous. What I'm saying close to failure is letting somebody maybe get one to fail, not failure. Like if you're not, you can always tell you if it's your 50, 50 on the way up the racket, like you're way too close to fail. Uh, but the reason is, is that you, st you understand what failure feels like. You don't have to go to fail. I'm talking about the compound. Now in the isolation exercises, you could do some, you know, biceps to failure as long as it's done well, they're not going to get hurt necessarily right it can happen of course but you know your lateral raises if you go to failure it's not the end of the world um, but that can help kind of find the boundaries of what is failure so you can get a little closer to failure sooner in those areas and again that helps to define well i don't know what two to fail is because i don't know what failure is that's fair that's that's fair um and so they can it can have a little bit of an uphill battle i tend to use reps and reserve um, across all exercises initially but kind of give this a caveat if you're not sure, especially the isolation exercise, go ahead and go to failure a set just so you know where the boundary is. And then you can work backwards from there. The fatigue, the fatigue punishment from that, the fatigue, um, you know, the punitive costs of fatigue there is not as significant as you would with the compound exercises. And certainly um, technique is not um, going to be affected as much, or at least it's not going to be a, something that causes an injury, like I mentioned before. RPE, rating of perceived exertion. So by the way, RER, good places I find to use this is compound movements, not necessarily like a Olympic style weightlifting. That's harder to define. RP is a better way to do that. In my opinion, um, I know RP RER, like powerlifters use RPE typically, but RER is a great uh, measurement for uh, hypertrophy work or great strategy, excuse me, for hypertrophy work. I think in any compound movement that is more like a powerlifting style movement, not something necessarily as dynamic as a snatch or clean and jerk. Um, so RPE rating perceived exertion, uh, we have a fair amount of data on this. Um, just as it's described your rating of how the set felt. So, um, you know, the, the research that exists is, you know, we see a lot of, of regression to the mean when we, um, you know, a coach gives a load or gives a workout and what they think the load or what the workout should be. This is called session RPE typically. And then what the individual reports and what typically happens is the good days when the coach is like, okay, pull back. The, the individual goes too hard and the days the coach is like, okay, hey, go hard. And the individual is like, I'm too tired. And so you end up this, this regression to the mean where the coach is thinking things are going to go up and down. Like they should, you know, the individual has been pushing too hard when they shouldn't have and not pushing when they, when they should. And so they just kind of have this flat line, no progress type of deal. So reason I say that, and that's session RP, that's a little different than um, RP within a set. It's the same idea though. Um, you have to be you have to be comfortable with the RP system and you have to be honest is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. So, uh, like an Olympic style weightlifting, 
it's helpful to know what your max is um, or at least close to it like that way you know you kind of have some idea of where you should be like for example i might say um, let's say what i call a pocket the pocket position snatch or some people call it a power position they're a little bit different that's a very light movement um, mo i use it for mostly for speed development and balance and so i might put a percentage on there of 60 percent of their max but then an rp of six and so rp usually from zero to ten corresponds to percentages of you know max but what that tells the individual is well here's a place to start and this one i'm talking about the minimums is work up to 60 percent of your max but if you're feeling like that's more like a seven then drop the load right it just gives some parameters like here's this one I'm talking about don't throw percentage-based training out you can use it as part of other methods um, and that helps the individual know what rp you know for the day feels like now as, as a more experienced person you know could say well here you know squat at an rp of eight and a half which i know like well eight and a half. some people don't use halves i use half eight and a half okay use an rp of eight and a half again that percentage can help and at least guide initially and as they start climbing up and realizing i'm already at an eight and a half uh, and i'm only at 80 percent, or i'm only at 75 percent of my max so that's what i'm talking about the stem using it as a stem um, and then the, you know, the top sets is where the RP comes in. So you can have this nice blending occur where it gives you some auto regulation at the top and some guidance so you're not just throwing darts in the dark, like, well, what's a six today? Well, you have some guidance percentage wise, you know, I want you at a 60%, but modulate the load as needed in order to meet the RPE and not force the percentage on your body when it's not, not really having it for the day. And this requires a motivated person and an honest person. Uh, that's the downside with using these auto-regulatory techniques is you have to be honest and you have to be willing to adjust. Okay, percentage to RP. So let's, what I'm referring to this is not just within a, tr a session now or within a particular exercise. I'm talking about overall, and I mentioned, I alluded to this already. Um, you know, you might start out with, once you kind of have that honeymoon period where you gain strength rapidly, you might work off percentages for a while. Um, or if you have athletes that, you know, that need a little bit of guidance initially, um, have them do percentage work for a cycle or so, and then you can start to introduce RER and RP. Um, you can do minimums. So, you know, you could say, um, this is now within a workout. Okay. Within one, or with, excuse me, with a training session, not a workout, with a, within a training session. Um, I want you to hit, um, you know, 80% of your max for three. And then from there go, and I'm talking about back into just one exercise you can go and hit an, an RPE of nine, right? So work up for up to that. Um, or if we skip down the bottom here, you know, what's your max for the day or multiple reps max for the day. Okay. I just want you to hit this minimum for one set. And then if you don't got it for the day, shut it down. If you do have it, they'll climb, um, and work up to a nine or go ahead and max out for the day. Um, and so it gives you a lot of options there. Um, you know, start with a percentage, hit a minimum. And then from there, that's a launch to, depending on how they feel. Again, it could be done for the day. That could be the end of the day. Um, if they're not feeling it or you notice they're, they're really ragged. Um, and you know, sometimes people are just lethargic and they need a little kick in the pants or you need a little kick in the pants to get going and jump off of that point. Other times, you know, that you're just tired. Um, you've been asking questions or you're, you're, you're asking yourself questions. If this is you saying, well, I had a bad night's sleep, but you know, I've been sick, blah, blah, blah. You know, that you just don't have it today. Well, don't smash yourself against the rocks. I mean, you could take one more set and see if you are climbing up for the max of the day or working up to a nine or whatever it may be. But if it isn't there, it isn't there. Um, you could even, you know, ramp up to a 90% and say, okay, now you got, I've done this before. You got two reps, right? Find your max for the day within two reps, all kinds of parameters you can put to make sure somebody doesn't go too hard, too, too far. Um, so multiple rep max for the day, it could be, you know, Hey, find your heaviest triple for the day, find your heaviest double for the day, whatever it may be. Um, again, we're talking about compound exercises here, not isolation. Isolation is a lot simpler to program. And again, if you go to fatigue, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, typically with isolation exercises, you can use reps in reserve and just use rep ranges. So, um, you know, when somebody has an idea of what they can DB row, you say, okay, today we're doing, you know, four sets of 12 DB row at an RER of two or an RIR of two, excuse me. Um, you know, they have an idea. Well, when I usually do DB row, I do this much weight at eight reps. So I'm going to try it with the eight rep load and see if I'm still two to fail. Yes, I am. Okay. I'm gonna keep going then until oh, last set. I need to take the load down a little bit to stay two from, you know, from fail. So on. So again, I'm talking about compound movement. I should have said that earlier. This is more about compound movements for the isolation supportive type of exercise, accessory work. Um, the, uh, either just a straight percentage can work, but I think just, just repetitions with some guidance about how many reps to leave in the tank is an effective way to do that. And I usually use two to one to fail, sometimes even to fail last set. 
um, on some of these isolation exercises. Isolation exercises, if you're not familiar, right? Lateral raises, dumbbells, tricep, or, uh, biceps work, triceps work, right? Anything that, uh, uh, you know, single arm lat pull down, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, what I mean by lat pull down, like kind of like the lat prayers, right? But with one arm, one joint moving for the most part. Okay. That's the whole idea. Okay. And the last one here, max out percentages. I use this one. I used to use this one a lot, like max out Fridays. Um, but again, it just, it, you smash people against the rocks and you put them up against something that they shouldn't try sometimes. And, it, and you know, if you're doing this and you're like, oh, this is max out day percentage based. And, you know, I'm going to hit this clean and jerk it and you just don't have it. You can get hurt. Okay. So I, I tend to, um, again, use a stem of some sort, work up to 85% for a single, see how you feel, hit your heaviest one for the day. You got three rep, you got a three rep lid on it. So you can't do 15 reps trying to find this max. You got three reps, find it. If you hit, if you hit a PR of the day, great. If you don't move on. Okay. So that's a typical max out approach. Now I don't do that very often for people that, um, I don't coach in person. Um, I do it occasionally. I stick mostly with the reps in reserve. Um, just because, uh, you know, not being there, sometimes it's helpful as a coach to provide some guidance. If you're by yourself, again, just be honest with yourself about where you're at. Film yourself or have somebody else watch you or whatever. If you're in your garage, you know, film yourself and watch and see, you know, correlate that to how you felt on the rep and make sure that your technique isn't breaking down. So you're just, again, smashing yourself against the rocks. It's not worth it. Uh, potentially pick up an injury. So hope that's helpful. I, I'm sure there's a lot of nuanced things, again, word of the decade, um, that I could talk about here, some alternates, uh, alternative ways of doing this. I'm sure some of you are doing different things. Leave a comment below. If you do, I'm always interested. Um, you know, this is how I've morphed how to approach these methods. Um, you know, again, I don't know if this title is, it makes any sense method progress, but, um, I'm just trying to think, you know, how I, I have questions at times. Well, what, what kind of method do you do? Um, I said all the time, I don't want to exaggerate. I have questions occasionally about this, um, this topic. And I, this is how my philosophy is, uh, kind of changed over the years, um, to something that's more audio auto regulated. And, and the reason is it took me a while on side note is cause I'm a control freak. You know, I'm just honest as a coach, I like to control things I like to, I like numbers. I like to, but you, you know, the more I've got, and I should know better because I've been a PhD in exercise physiology. I mean, you know, you think I would be one to understand the individual, you know, the importance of individuals and the, the importance of fatigue and, um, all of the different contributions from the outside world to an athlete or an individual that's training. Um, you know, but even I was more like, well, you know, stick to the script, you know, blah, blah, blah. you know, this is, this is numbers and you should be here at this point and here at that point. That's kind of the old school way of thinking. Um, but I had to abandon that because I realized that was not helping anybody. In fact, in some cases, I think it actually hurt people. And so, um, you know, maybe not physically hurt them to the point where they had to go get surgery, but to the point where it's not, it, it's hindering their progress. Um, so, you know, you might want to look at some of these things. If you're a percentage based person and you're like me, a control freak, you might have to start relin relinquishing some control a little bit for those that, you know, can handle it and maybe look at some of these other methods and how to combine why still, you can still maintain con some control, make sure the quality of progressive overload is occurring, but you're doing it in such a way you're not forcing the program on the individual. Uh, same with, you know, if you're training yourself, we are always hardest on ourselves. I should be hitting this today. What's the matter with me? Well, just be honest with yourself and hit what you can for the day and know that, you know, you're down today, you may be up later. So next time you come in or later in the week, you may be up. And so you may be feeling good. Then you can go ahead and go hard because these methods not only protect you from getting crushed, they also allow for the days when you feel great. Uh, and that's, that's wonderful. Now within these methods, there still has to be a progressive overload. I mentioned uh, RPE, you know, you don't, you don't just do the same RPE every day. If you want to get stronger, you got to, you have to change the percent the RPE as well. So you know, um, while percentage based training may be, uh, week one, 75% average, right? Week two, 80, week three, 80, 85. Well, you just transfer those to, you know, seven and a half, eight and eight and a half. There still has to be a progressive overload. That's why you have to be, um, you know, if you're coaching somebody, they have to be mature enough to understand this process. And if you yourself are doing, it, you have to be mature enough to be honest with yourself, but also understand that there should be some sort of progressive overload occurring. Otherwise, you know, if you feel bad every day, that's reflective of some bad recovery, um, you know, or technique or some issues going on, uh, worth looking at, uh, if you can't progress, um, in some way, right. And it may be that that 77.5 to eight is still 7.5, but the next week you're at eight and eight and a half. You just needed a week that you were down more. 
that's okay. But if you're still seven and a half and you should be hitting nines, um, there's something else going on that you need to look at. Maybe, maybe it's programming or, you know, some of the accessory work that you're um, lacking, but it's probably has to do something recovery. Okay. So again, if you, hit, you should be hitting nine loads and you're still at seven and a half, that's what I'm getting at. There's a problem there, but there has to be a progressive overload. Don't lose fat, that side of that. It's, a lot of regulation is great. There has to still be some sort of progressive overload or will, there will not be progress. And I think that's where the stems come in really handy, hitting minimums. Um, you know, they don't force anything too tragic on, on somebody, but you still have a progress in the stem. So you have to hit 75 today. You have to hit 80 next week. You got to hit 85 that week. But then after that, the RP kicks in um, and lets the individual, maybe you or somebody you're coaching, take it the rest of the way. Okay. That's 20 minutes. That's a long time. I hope you're still engaged with the video. I think it's an interesting topic. I hope you found it valuable. Again, subscribe to the channel. If you would like to hear more in this wonderful field, exercise, sports science, nutrition science, I'll catch you in the next video.